Hello. Good afternoon, and thanks so much for joining us for Results 2022 International Conference. And welcome to the panel discussion that's entitled The Hardships and Nuances of Lived Poverty Experience. You have before you today four experts on poverty, and they are Aaron Carrillo, Yvonne Montoya, Clara Moore, and Siobhan Williams. And ladies and gentlemen, I'm gonna be asking them a series of questions. And at the end of our discussion, we're gonna open up to you. So if you have any questions, feel free to type them in the chat. So with that, I'm gonna move on. My first question is, the four of you are here at the table with absolutely different experiences. How do they interconnect? And let's see, I'll start that when I'm gonna call on Aaron. Thank you so much, Pamela. Uh, I think for all four of us in the room right now, we have all had different experiences that brought us to the table with results. Those vary from housing, from you know our lived experiences, but also from our own research and expertise. So I really call on the fact that when by the time I was 18, I moved 21 times and going through and being evicted in different locations, finding the constant resourcefulness at the ages of 12, 14, 16, understanding uh, walking into the water bill and giving them a check and having the clerk look at you sideways and say, is this gonna bounce? And you just play the child that just smiles and says, have a great day. Those kinds of lived experiences brought us all together here today to really nuance towards the ideas of not only our lived experiences, but what we bring to the table for our politicians, our congressmen and other volunteers. Uh, thank you. I think uh, Clara, can you shed some light on that? How is, is this all interconnected? Sorry, I forgot to unmute. Hi everyone. Um, for me, so when I talk about uh, experts on power, experts on policy, experts on poverty and policy. Um, I like to talk about our lived experience and our lived experience is what brings us here and also what makes us policy experts. And I often say like, we're, we're experts, but not because we have degrees, not because of any cr credentials. Our credential is our life, right? But what's interesting to know is a lot of us actually do have degrees and a lot of us are actually credentialed. But the reason that I bring up the lived experience is because that to me makes me more of an expert on, pov on poverty, on anti-poverty legislation and on the impacts of policy. Mm -hmm. And we all have four very disparate life stories, but we can all come together and all understand each other's experiences because poverty is such a specific trauma that um, shows its face in many ways, but kind of always shows up the same. At the end of thank the day. You. Thank you, Claire. Excellent. And speaking of their different things that they've been through or where they're at today, let me tell you a little bit about them. Aaron just graduated with a master's in health administration from the University of Kansas Medical Center, and he aspires to improve accessibility of health care within the United States. He's currently residing in Wichita, Kansas, and one of the things that he often speaks about is how poverty impacts health. Then we have Miss Clara who just spoke a moment ago. She, believe it or not, is a longtime chef who discovered a passion for policy and data. And as she admitted, yes, she has a degree. She's a graduate of Rutgers University's Blue Stein School, and she works for the University of Missouri's Institute of Mental Health. Right now, Clara's living in Newark, New Jersey, and she's been an expert on poverty with us now for five years. And typically she can talk for days about how poverty is a never ending cycle that seems to be impossible to get out of. Then coming up next, we have Yvonne Montoya. She has spent the last nine years advocating for fair housing and accessibility to quality food for all Americans. As a homeless college student back in 2012, she helped pass California's legislation allowing homeless and low-income college students to use SNAP EBT cards at campus eateries. And she's still on several national and local boards, is working with a community 
Development, a CDC, where she supports a network of organizations in both Kansas and California. She resides in Salina, Kansas, and she can talk to you at no end about how to put the skills that you learn during your poverty experience to work for advocacy. And then we have Siobhan. Siobhan is committed to addressing food access, homelessness, wellness, and education, particularly in urban communities. And she has shaped her education, her community service efforts, and her career based on having experienced all of those things in her own life. She's a Harlem, New York native, currently living in Indianapolis, Indiana, and she's been a part of Results since 2013 and one of our SOEOPs since 2015. And she can talk to you at no end about the cost of being poor and how poverty makes you good at things because you have to do so much extra work to survive. So with that, I'm gonna take us to our second question. And uh, let's see, Siobhan, we haven't heard from you yet. How about, can you share with the audience, why do you feel it is important for people to understand the experiences of poverty? Um, that's a good question, Pamela. Hopefully everyone can hear me. Okay, good. So I would say, you know, at the end of the day, we are human, just like you. Um, however, we've been through the trenches in order uh, to be the individuals that we are today. Um, I ask you to just give us grace, you know, at a time and in moments, um, because at the end of the day, um, we want you, you won't be able to ever understand the experience we have encountered of being in poverty, but you can feel it, you can imagine it, um, and be able just to provide us the opportunity to actually elevate our story. And remember that you don't have to apologize for our past, um, our upbringing, and just even in our current situation now. And I think it's also just having a listening ear for those who want to understand what poverty is like and what those experiences are. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now, we all know that typically policy comes from the top down. How do we reverse that narrative? And I'm going to pose that question to Yvonne. We haven't heard from you yet. Thank you, Pamela. It's an honor to be on this panel discussion with my colleagues who all bring their uh, different lived experiences to the table and their impacts on creating policies that will positively impact those living in policy, um, poverty currently. Um, I believe, and it's been my experience through a lived experience of being homeless, that the policies that need to be um, created have to start from the bottom. They have to act, include those who are living in poverty. They have to bring them to the table and ask them, what do you need in order to get out of your situation? You can't make policies for, you. it's like telling someone how to be poor. It's like the broken windows story. It's about the rats. And until they bring us into the table, they are gonna be creating policies that don't get down to the most basic of necessities that will help us get out of our situations of poverty. And the way the system is designed right now, it is designed by policymakers who have not asked for the input of those living in poverty. Hence, the reason why it is so hard to get out of the system. This system, the way it's designed, is designed to keep you in the system because they have not asked those living in poverty what it is they exactly need to get out of their situation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Yvonne. Now, I also want to give you each an opportunity. Uh, let's take about three minutes, perhaps, and go into detail a little bit more about yourselves and who you are before we go on to additional questions. I'm going to begin with Siobhan, because I see you on the screen first. All right. So I want to just get into more detail about like the cost of being poor and what why does it cost so much to be poor in America? So I know we're not all on camera, but how many you can say is expensive to be poor? Just a raise of hands. And if you don't want to raise your hand, it's okay. All right, perfect. Um, it's also just in a sense of when you don't have money, you're often forced to like make these difficult decisions. And sometimes it can add up to like a long-term burden, which can lead to the cycle of poverty. Nobody ever wants to be poor. Nobody wants to live um, with expenses that exceed their income or just struggle and just make it, you know, paycheck to paycheck. And what I've learned is the reality of just being poor imposes conditions that continue for me and others to be in poverty. 
and I can attest this for myself. So when I think about the financial stress, that's a whole, uh, it's touchy at the same time, but understanding how poor people spend their money and knowing that those who are low income in America, they spend over 80% of their income on essentials. So that leaves me or others with no cushion when things go wrong. So for example, I purchased a home a couple of years ago. Within the first few years, I had to replace my water heater. I had to replace my AC unit or get a converter to something. I don't know what the title is. And then also replace my furnace. Until this day, I'm still paying off um, my furnace. And this has caused, you know, financial stress and my livelihood. And I'm glad to have, you know, heat and cool air. But at the end of the day, you know, my income is going towards Yes, I'm paying for my home and making sure that my mortgage is on time, but then I have these additional expenses that I wasn't planning on um, occurring during this time. So that is causing financial stress. Um, also, the aspects of you know, housing, food, and transportation, that dominates spending for most Americans, especially with the pandemic um, happening now and still continuing. We know the cost of um, housing has increased. Uh, food and groceries have increased extremely high. I still go to the pantry to this day. I go at least once a week to my local pantry so I can get the things that I need. And then depending on what I get from the pantry, I substitute whatever I can get from the grocery store so that I can make a decent meal for my family. And let's not even talk about <laughs> transportation because we already know the gas prices are high. And if you live in a city where you know there's adequate transportation, the prices for those bus passes or metro passes are increasing as well. Um, and another thing that causes this financial stress and keeps you in the cycle of being in poverty is healthcare. Um, it's a touchy subject for me because I feel like healthcare should be universal, free for all, universal and free for all. But in 2019, I suffered from a stroke while overseas. Now you're probably looking like, how you get overseas? So I will let you know this. I save for the things that I like to do. So I will save my money. <laughs> and some people on this call will know that will save my money for a trip that I want to go on. It doesn't matter how long I had to save for it. And I ended up having a stroke overseas and thank God I had um, travel insurance, but still I was in a whole nother country, then had to get flown to from that country, which was Turks and Caicos to Florida, which is not where I live, then back to Indiana. So just think about the medical bills, how much is mounting up. So that caused me um, in April to actually file for bankruptcy because half of my income was going towards my medical bills. It didn't matter if I, you know, contacted my insurance company or if I wrote a letter um, and all that stuff. I had to find a way to release this financial burden that was, you know, on hold on me. Well, it was holding on to me. Thank so you, again, Thank you. Sorry. I'm going to give, Clara, I'm going to give three minutes to tell a little bit about your situation, what, what it's been and who you are. You got on mute, you know. Yeah, okay, sorry. So as Pamela said before, I did just uh, receive a graduate degree. And um, so I slipped, I've slipped in and out of poverty my whole life. So I grew up in poverty. And then, you know, I kind of got out of it, then back into it, then back out of it. And that is really the nature of poverty for most people. Most people get in, are living on the edge, right? And it is incredibly difficult to elude I have owned a house. I've published a book. I've been on national television. I've owned a successful restaurant and been featured in local media. I have a graduate degree. And through all of that, I was slipping in and out of poverty the entire time. So I just want to dispel the myth that poverty comes only for those without successes and only for those without opportunities. That is not true. The, true, the, the reality of America is you very often can't make something out of nothing. I have been haunted, every milestone has been haunted by old credit card debt. Every success is outweighed by the fact that I'm still living hand to mouth. <clears throat> and my greatest accomplishment, my beautiful daughter, was the thing that put me into the most debilitating, depressing, and deepest poverty of my life, which is a whole nother subject, right, about ch childhood poverty. But right now, um, I graduated from school and then I finally got a, a job, like a real job, right? Like a benefits, like the job, right? Um, 
and before that, I was on Medicaid, I was on food stamps, I was on a, a assistance for uh, heating assistance, you know, all those sort of things. And I was scraping by a couple part time jobs. So now I have this full time job. But I'm, I'm actually doing worse, to be honest with you, because when you factor in co pays and insurance and all this other stuff, I don't make that much money. And I don't have any assistance. So I'm actually not doing as well, even though it looks like I am. So I'm still saddled with debt, right? I'm still living hand to mouth. I am 41. I should be at the most, my, my highest earning potential, but I'm still scraping by. So I'm probably never going to get out of poverty at this rate. I have to be honest about that, right? And so what's really important and what I want to impress upon you is that poverty doesn't look like what you think it might look like. And also it does not easily let go. And those are the reasons why I think that all of us are so important to have at the table during policy, like policy decisions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Clara. Erin, you're next up on my screen. Want to share a few minutes of what life has been and is for like for you in poverty? Of course. So poverty for me has always been a way of life. It's added in resourcefulness. It's added in a sense of knowing things that a lot of my cohort members do not know. Through my graduate program, I helped three different people change a tire and they had never done it before. They had this idea of calling roadside assistance, but when it was an hour and a half, I was like, got a spare in the back. And they were like, where? I was like, let's go find out. Let, let, let's get up. Come on, let's go. And I think this resourcefulness is something that my friends always share that is a strength that I have. But through this resourcefulness is so many pained and traumatic memories for me. And this is something I really do want to share. I'm, I've had the great honor and opportunity to be a regional coordinator with results. <laughs> And one of the questions that is always posed is how do we keep volunteers with lived experience in results and to continue on in a way that facilitates space for them? And I think what we forget is poverty isn't separated from our volunteer life, our work life and everything else. It is something that is always on our shoulders. So when a volunteer doesn't respond to an email for two and a half weeks, maybe there's other things going on in the background that you just haven't caught wind of. And so the question that tends to follow that is, so what can we do to support them? I think sometimes reaching out outside of results, reaching out and really earning and building trust with our volunteers is something that we can do better in results and really just seeing people. So I guess my biggest goal forward has always been to ensure that people feel like they're seen, to ensure that as our volunteers are moving forward, we try to share experiences that make them feel comfortable. And we encourage this kind of, not camaraderie, but understanding that I may not understand the position you're in and may never, but I will continue to grow with you and try and hear what you have to say. And that is valid and that is valuable. And if you can't make it to a meeting with the congressmen, congresswomen, senators, or if you can't make a meeting, it's not the end of the world. This is volunteering and this is something that you choose to do, but always reminding people why they have the seat at the table and why it will always be open is the way that volunteers continue to stay. So I may be resourceful. I may be a student that just graduated and like Clara jumping into my big boy job, but I will always be somebody that has poverty writing on my back. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you, Erin. And Yvonne, how about yourself? Um, well, my um, experience with poverty came late in life. Um, for eight years, I had my own event planning business, um, and I was doing um, private movie screenings with the major movie studios. I was doing book launches, um, creating soirees called Chicklet and Chocolates, doing um, fashion line private screen, private viewings with BCBG, Max Osria, Michael Kors, um, Alison Olivia, and creating these soirees where women were coming in and paying $40 a ticket, which all went to me, um, just to sip shop and socialize. Unfortunately, the recession hit and I found myself like so many other Americans, a casualty of the recession. And um, I lost my business because women were no longer spending $40 um, a pop to sip, sop, sip shop and socialize. 
uh, living in California at the time. I was born and raised in California. Um, it is so expensive. I quickly went through my recession and uh, went through my savings and found myself homeless. And um, by the grace of God, my I have three children and my ex said, well, I will, don't worry about the kids. You take care of yourself. You figure out how you're going to get out of your situation, but I will take care of the kids. And so he did. I had to worry about myself and I went from here to here and it was a shock to me and I had no idea how I was going to get out of my situation. Um, this went on for months and then one cold October night, I was sleeping outside and trying to stay warm. And I looked up at the sky and I said, this is ridiculous. I am too smart and I have too many skills to let this become who I am. And there was another homeless person sleeping not too far away from me. Mm -hmm. And he said, you know what? You need to go down to um, social services in downtown. It's an emergency assistance and go get yourself some benefits and tell them what's going on. And so I did. The next morning I went down and... Um, I knew that the only way to get out of my situation was to finish my education in college. I had been going since my kids were little, but it was impossible to finish because my oldest son was a severe asthmatic and um, I was continuously having to um, quit jobs because um, we were always in and out of the hospital. So I went down there and I knew I had to get um, out of my situation. I got um, an emergency voucher for a hotel. Unfortunately, by the time school started in January, my voucher had expired and I started um, college um, homeless for the first four weeks. Um, luckily, I was determined to get out of my situation. I stood by the dean's um, financial aid, the dean's office, and I waited for her to come back and I said, look, I need my financial aid. I am homeless and I'm trying to go to school and I have a full load and I need it. And she, by the end of the week, I had my financial aid and by the grace of God, I found um, an apartment, a room to rent across the street from school. But what I noticed while I was homeless is you start to notice those who are also homeless um, and it's not evident, but you notice that that um, backpack that they're dragging around is actually full of clothes. You understand that um, they're, they're starving, they'll look at you, they'll be sitting in the cafeteria, but they're not eating. And one of the most basic of necessities for a college student is having access to quality food. Unfortunately, all I had was my EBT, my food stamps, and our campus was not accepting food stamps, nor was any other campus in the state of California. As I went along and finished my um, associates in business real estate, I knew that there was policies that I had to change in order to help those who were in my situation as well. So I transferred to Santa Monica College and um, joined a student think tank, the Roosevelt Institute, which taught me how to write policy for change. I chose my um, situation as a food insecure college student and started calling around and noticed that no campuses in California were accepting it. And that's how my um, commitment to food insecurity on college campuses began. And I did that for three years. And in 2016, Governor Brown signed um, legislation to allow college students to use their SNAP EBT card at campus eateries. To this day, I am a committed, committed advocate to addressing food insecurity in communities and college campuses and changing the policies that are created right now to keep so many Americans from accessing um, quality food because of the criteria that is used um, to determine um, eligibility for SNAP. Thank and you, food thank you so much. That That is, I've heard it before, but it hits me the same every time. Thank you, Yvonne. Mm -hmm. So you brought up the issue of policy. Let's talk a little bit about policy. How do we write a policy that actually gives continuous support so that people are not living so close to the danger of falling back into poverty once they manage to momentarily get out of it? I'm going to, let's see who I haven't heard from. Let's go back to Clara. How we write policy to Thank give you. continuous support, Clara. Thank you. This is actually very dear to my heart because of oh, what good, I was good. talking about. 
Um, and I think it's very, very important that that we start writing policy, not just for the deepest, the people in the deepest of poverty, but those who live on the edge, because the, there is a lot of anxiety and excruciating mm, things that happen when you're just on the edge of poverty and almost about to fall back in, right? And you're just on the edge. So one of the most important things I think is to raise limits. The mean testing limits have to be raised, absolutely. And then other, other things have to be done through the tax code um, that extend how long people can get services and maybe extend out that the cutoffs, right? Another important thing, which is not exactly policy, but is uh, unionizing, I think is an, another thing that, that can help people to stay out of poverty, help people to secure themselves even more, secure their jobs, secure good pay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Aaron, can you respond to that? You have something you can add to that? How do we write policy that continuously supports people and keeps them from the edge? So uh, just kind of piggybacking off of Clara's idea of ensuring that not only are we helping those in the deepest of poverty, but those on edge or just getting out of it. I think with resourcefulness comes a sense of guilt when resources are used that we feel like we're not adequate to be using. When we get out of poverty, we may not look at housing assistance or continue to look at our insurances and how we're paying because there's a certain level of I'm out and I have so many others that need that instead of me, so why me? So I think as advocates and volunteers, especially as we're bringing people to the table that are just newer to results or just wanting to really share their passion or frustrations, we have a sense of right to make sure that people understand that they are worth the help, they are worth ensuring that they're gonna to continue to grow and continue to allocate you know, resources, and we need to continue to bring those to light. If you know of a resource and you just share it within a group, you don't know who you're helping in that group. But even if you just help one person, that is an active change that'll continuously to help us grow. And I think that's where I'd like to see policy continue to grow as well and our advocates to really push on. Thank you, thank you. And since we're on the topic of policy, I want to try to squeeze in just two more questions that I wanna ask you. Uh, I'm going to go to Yvonne. Yvonne, could you briefly explain please, why do you think that people with lived experience of poverty need to be included in the determination of policy decisions and priorities? They People with lived experience know how the system is. They know where it's broken. They know when there, where there is a gap. They know where that gap is not being fulfilled. They know what it would take in order to get to the next level. Nobody wants to live in poverty. Nobody ever grew up saying, when I get older, I wanna live in poverty. I wanna be poor or I wanna be homeless. But when you live, have a lived experience, when you live in poverty, you know what services you need to get out. And you also know what services are not there. When they start asking those with lived experience, when they start changing those policies by listening to those with lived experience, then and only then will we be able to see the changes that are needed to keep to help them get out and to keep them out. Unfortunately, we are never consulted and we are told how to be poor. We are told what policies we need. And this is why it is impossible. The criteria used keeps us in there and it will continue to keep us in there until we are brought to the table to tell them to tell them what we need to get out and stay out. Thank you, thank you so much, Yvonne. Um, my next question, I'm gonna pose this to Yvonne. You got the chance to be quiet over there. Um, Yvonne, can you tell me some of the things that you think people might be surprised at about being at the roots of poverty? What do, what do you think would sure. surprise most people? Um, that's a great question, Ms. Pamela. So I would say, you know, mm -hmm. at the end of the day, it's generational, but knowing, going back to what Yvonne said, no one wakes up and say, you know, I want to be poor today or I want to be poor tomorrow. Many situations um, are out of our control, unfortunately. And I would say just from my example, I had an amazing childhood growing up, but guess what? I didn't know I was in poverty. Um, mm -hmm. I found that I was poor through the kids at school because my shoes was talking one day and I was like, what are you talking about? But literally when you have your soul and the rubber and it meets and 
clearly you've been wearing it for too long. And growing up in Harlem, I used to walk from 152nd Street to 144th Street because I did not qualify for a bus pass because the school was actually outside of my district. So of course my shoes were talking because of that. Um, but again, I didn't know I was poor because I thought I just had the best childhood ever. And also just understanding like there was a church that wasn't too far by and me and my mom would go and get meals from the, hot milk from the church. It was Resurrection Church. And then we would go sit in the park and eat and have a good time. Again, I didn't know I was poor. Someone else, someone else had to tell me that I was poor. But in my mind, I had a great childhood, even when it came to Christmas. Um, my mom would write letters to, you know, the local Salvation Army or the Urban League or the YMCA. And guess what? We had a great Christmas every single year. And it goes back to what even Aaron said, being resourceful. People don't associate those who are in poverty being resourceful. My mom is educated. Yes, she didn't finish college, but she knows she knows what to do and she knows how to get by. And I think those um, abilities that she has had and still has, I've been able to do. So anytime that I know a resource, I think it was just last week about free car seats for people who have children. I sent that out to someone to share it because like, it does me no good to know the resource and if I can't share it to other people. So I think, again, it goes back to what Yvonne and Claire and Aaron said, is just us being resourceful and being those who have had lived experience and able to share our story. Thank you, thank you, wow, <laughs> wow. Your mom sounds like amazing. You, you picked up those good traits for, that's awesome. <laughs> Hey, so now we've got a few minutes left. Let's go ahead and if we can and take a few questions from the audience. Those can be via chat or if somebody wants to unmute and ask a question, by all means, we're all here to answer. Okay, and I'm, I'm also looking in the chat to see if I see it. I have, I have a question. Yes. Um, my question is, um, how do you get yourself like out of being stuck in poverty? I'm trying to do that right now. I wouldn't I would say that me, I'm, I'm not like homeless or anything. I, um, I live in joy housing, but I, I have, I still have money to like buy things because I don't use like other types of governments. It's like SSI food stamps. I use my own money because I come from one of those families. Where it's, it's better to have. It's like um, I come from one of those. I'm, I'm an immigrant from my family is our immigrants from Ghana. So we come from that mindset, it's better to have two or three jobs and to use those sort of things. So I'm trying to, to find ways to get myself out of choice housing. Also, um, do you guys have any, any anyone, who, anyone who wants to speak on that, please? I'll go ahead and start. Um, thank you for sharing uh, some of your life with us today. Uh, I appreciate when people do that. I. I come from a family where my mom lifted us by our bootstraps, each and every one of us, we all pulled our weight. I think, you know, understanding that two or three jobs can be very unsustainable. And uh, I know that you can do it. It's just at what cost that is. So understanding that if there are resources that are available to you that can help you better your situation and your family situation, that's where I'd start. Um, you can continue working those jobs and continue putting back. But as Siobhan shared, a lot of us are one mishap away. I had a, an emergency tonsillectomy. My tonsils have always been the size of meatballs. And when that happened, uh, I lost two of my jobs. I still had two of them, but I was still a full-time college student with medical debt. And it was only because I ran into the financial assistance office at the local hospital. The person just walked by me and her papers fell everywhere. And I saw financial assistance and I'm like, what do you do? That one question was a difference in a $12,000 emergency bill, dropping down to 2,000, dropping down to $800. And that was changing for me. Thank you, thank you, Aaron. Um, I see a question here that someone wants to know. Uh, let's see. They wanna know, they said, uh, and they posed it to you, Aaron. So while you're speaking, they wanna know how do results groups connect with EOPs in their area? I answered that question in the chat. If you have any future okay. questions, I just wanna be cognizant of time and I wasn't. Uh -huh. Thank you. Um, I got another question. They said, 
what would be your list of human rights needs? It's a two-part question, but for the sake of time, let's start with that part. Who wants to answer that? Again, I'll repeat it. What would be your list of human rights needs? I'll, I'll start. Um, I would have to say uh, human rights needs, the most basic of necessities is the accessibility to quality food and housing with um, the two go hand and healthcare, quality healthcare. It has to be all encompassing and it doesn't matter if you have a roof over your head, if you have no access to healthcare to make sure that you are in good health. And it also coincides with healthy eating. Um, it's not enough to say, I have SNAP if your SNAP is not allowing you accessibility to quality food and a home to cook that quality food in. So I would say it has to be all encompassing of the most basic of necessities, it's, that it's housing, healthcare, and um, accessibility to quality food. Thank you, thank you. I could relate to that. I also have a poverty story. And although I had food stamps, it was being a presumption made that I had a stove and refrigerator, which I didn't for many months. Just living, not the, the need that it shouldn't be there, just not being able to live above your means. And also you have to understand with the cliff effect. So someone who's been on benefits mm -hmm. and they wanna get, you know, their uh, employer wants to give them a raise and it could be just 25 cents or a dollar. They have to think about, okay, do I take that raise and I lose all my benefits? Or do I say, you know, no, thank you. Thank you for recognizing my work, but I cannot take that raise right now. Because a lot of those things affect your childcare, your, your, um, mm -hmm. your income, and then also your food and transportation. So it's just like, if you do it, you do it. If you don't, you don't. It's almost like a gamble you have to play to make sure that you're trying to elevate yourself out of poverty. Okay, I have another question. It says, how can other volunteers work with EOPs with people such as us who have lived experiencing at results? How can other volunteers work with us? So I think Aaron um, wrote that in the, like how to get a hold of us. But I do want to take this opportunity to talk about how to, as in how to effectively, safely, and honestly do it. Um, it's really, really important, really, really important that you understand that po with poverty comes trauma. Like, I do not know a poor person who doesn't have a bunch of trauma. So you really need to focus on trauma-informed communication and, and understanding and believing people when they tell you things. Um, like someone said earlier, like you may not hear for a volunteer for two weeks, they're probably going through something. And of the EOP that I know, which is all of them, we have worked diligently to get all this together for the IC, for the IC, all volunteering our time while in the midst of crises, in the midst of four jobs, in the midst of trying to raise our children as single parents, like there's a lot but we are so dedicated that we push through all of that. So just to understand that we have a lot going on and we carry a huge weight coming to this space. Thank you, Claire. 